Let's now think about the energy stored in an oscillator, a mechanical oscillator. The energy is stored in two forms. There's a kinetic energy of the mass and the potential energy stored in the spring. So let's think about the kinetic energy first. So kinetic energy is very simply given by half mv squared, written v as the derivative of x here. And we can substitute in our solution for x, a cos omega t plus phi, and take its derivative, and then we can write half mv squared as a half m a squared omega squared sine squared omega t plus phi. So this here, this is the kinetic energy of our mass. We can also write this as half k a squared sine squared omega t plus phi, taking the omega squared and replacing it by k divided by a. And so you have some cancellation that goes on here. And so we can eliminate the omega and the mass and replace it with the spring constant if we wish. Next, we move on to the potential energy. So the potential energy in the spring is given by a half k x squared. And so substituting in for x, the position, we get a half k a squared cos squared omega t plus phi. What's the total energy in the oscillator then? Well, we add these two up. Some of the kinetic and potential energy is a half k squared a squared cos squared blah 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 blah. But here we have a cos squared plus a sine squared so we can uh, with the same argument. So this part here inside these brackets settle equals 1 so we can get rid of it leaving us with an expression for the total energy as half k a squared or half m a squared omega squared and that's just rearranging the k to be equal to uh, m omega squared here. So these are two different ways of expressing the total energy in an oscillator. Okay, so in this case we've assumed that the energy in the oscillation is constant, that is there is no loss of energy during the motion of the oscillation. And this is a fairly unphysical situation. In every conceivable physical oscillator, energy will be lost to friction and um, therefore there will be some generation of heat, the kinetic energy is converted into heat typically. So we're going to think now about an oscillator with some loss and we're going to imagine that as the mass is now being dragged along our frictionless surface but our frictionless surface has some fluid in it and we have what we call viscous damping in this fluid and this as you're pushing the fluid around adds a damping force to the motion of the mass. So as before the restoring force due to the spring is given by Hooke's law so force is equal to negative k times x but now we're going to add this damping force this damping force F is given by some constant R, so it depends on how viscous your fluid is, how much resistance there is to the motion, but the force is proportional to the negative of the velocity of the mass. So the faster the mass is going, the higher the damping force will be, and the damping force is always in the opposite direction to the motion of the mass, so it's in the opposite direction to the velocity. So whichever way you're going, the damping force is pushing against you. Now from Newton's law we have that some of the forces must be equal to mass times acceleration. So we add up the Hooke's law force from the spring and the damping force from um, our viscous damping situation. And we can write down a new equation of motion where the acceleration, x double dot, is given by some term proportional to the velocity of the motion and the position of the motion. So this term here is what we had initially. This is the new term here, which is due to the damping. And we're going to look for a solution to this equation now. So the solution to that equation will look something like this. It's going to be some sort of a decaying exponential which is now multiplying our cosine or sine function. So the amplitude out the front here that used to be a constant is now decaying. But we still have this thing which is oscillating at a, as a cosine with a phase shift or equivalently as the real part of a complex exponential or equivalently as a sum of complex exponentials. The rate of decay here, gamma on 2, um, gamma is given by r on m, and the oscillation frequency here is now given by this equation here. So you can see this oscillation frequency omega with damping is just a little bit slower than the oscillation frequency without damping, which is omega naught. The solution here, which includes an oscillation, is valid provided gamma on 2 is less than omega naught. If the 
damping here is too big, so if gamma on 2 is greater or equal to omega on naught, then the system is so damped it stops oscillating altogether. So you can imagine that, you know, instead of having water or oil here that you're dragging your mass through, you use something like honey, the mass will just kind of go bleh and won't oscillate at all. So we're thinking about a regime here where the damping is small. This damping rate uh, here is small compared to the um, the natural oscillation frequency omega naught. In fact, it's also worth noting at this point that if the damping here is sufficiently small, like a, a factor of 10 or so less than omega naught, then it's valid to approximate omega as being equal to omega naught. That's a really good approximation, and it's an approximation we often make. So a decaying oscillation would look something like this. So there's the oscillation with some frequency, and you can see the envelope here in red, which is the decaying exponential amplitude. So this is the solution that you want to try and fit to it. So imagine this is some experimental data. We want to try and determine you know, the oscillation frequency and the phase shift and gamma from this data. So let's go ahead and do that. So the starting amplitude, a naught is equal to 2, because that's what we have at time equal to 0. So a naught must be equal to 2. And we see it's also at the peak here. So it's a cosine function. So the phase here, phi, must be equal to 0. So we've got phi equal to 0 and a0 equal to 2 from this um, starting position here. The period of the oscillation, if we count 10 periods, we get to 6.7 seconds. So this period of the oscillation must be 0.67 seconds, which gives us a frequency of 1.5 hertz, or omega is equal to 3 pi uh, seconds to the minus 1. So now we know the frequency omega. What about the exponential decay rate? Well, the starting amplitude here is 2, Let's go to the place where it's decayed by a factor of 1 on e. So 2 divided by e is 0.74. So we go over here to find that time, which is 10 seconds. So the 1 on e decay time is 10 seconds. And the 1 on e decay time here must be equal to 2 divided by gamma. So gamma is 0.2 seconds. So now we have everything. We know gamma. We know a naught. We know omega. We know phi. So we can say that x is a function of time is 2 times negative e to the t divided by 10 times cos 3 pi t.